Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of the come and to study your word. And now as we begin, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here to lead us and to guide us, to speak to us individually and personally where we are at. Uh, everyone here has a different background. We're all at a different place on our journey with you. Uh, but I pray as you reach Nebuchadnezzar through a dream using the image of an idol, as you reach Daniel through the dream with uh, the image of sanctuary, I pray that you would reach us where we are at and help us to come to a deeper walk with you. So bless us now as we study. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's presentation is entitled, The Power of the Mind and Heart as a Man Thinks. As a Man Thinks. When I converted from atheism to Christianity, I was a little bit, how shall I say, crazy about the Bible. Amen? Amen. Uh, you see, when I was a child, my first job I ever had, I was in the third grade when I got my first job. And I had the worst boss you can possibly work for. I worked for my dad. <laughs> my recommendation, don't work for family. <laughs> it was great though. So I was, a, a, I was a, um, a trash boy and a maintenance man for an apartment complex in the third grade. Had my belt, had my screwdriver, had my tape, measuring tape, you know. And I, I, I through the years, would learn a, a lot of uh, handiwork, which would become beneficial later on in life. But that was my first job. And my dad taught me something at a young age. And again, he was my dad, so I had to hear about work every time I went home. Uh, he taught me something at a very young age. And that is, if you're going to do something, you need to do it 110%. If you're going to do it, you need to be all in. And I, one day I, I was, so I, my first job working for him in the apartment complex was picking up trash. So after school, I would get a five gallon bucket and one of them little long arm things with a claw at the end, right? And my job was to walk around the whole property and pick up all the trash. And I would get X amount of money for the time put in. So I remember one time I was going to throw some trash away and I noticed that behind the dumpster there was trash. Like people throw trash and it goes over behind the dumpster. And I thought, huh. It's like you don't see it unless you're looking for it. So I got creative, you know. I said, well, I don't have to pick up all the trash. You just can't see the trash. So as a kid, I would kick cans and bushes and stuff like that as I was picking up trash because I don't want to make multiple trips. And then one day, my dad decided to do a thorough walkthrough of the property, and guess what? Yeah, I got in trouble, right? It's one thing when you get in trouble at work with your boss. When it's your dad, it's double trouble, right? So I got in trouble, and that's why my dad gave me this lecture. Look, if you're going to do it, you need to do it 110%. You need to do it with, with all you got. And that's how I was raised. Um, that, you know, when I became a fisherman, I wanted to go fishing. My uncle started taking me fishing. I wanted to be the best fisherman. I wanted to be excellent. So I used to subscribe to all the magazines. I used to study the different colors of lakes. I used to study the movement of winds and the different types of bushes and different bugs that they ate. Like I would like study it like it was like class or something, right? And I was like, I'm going to be the best fisherman. And that's just how I was raised. If you're going to do it, you do it right. So when I became a Christian from atheism, I knew nothing about the Bible. Pastors often up front say things like, oh, you know the story of David and Goliath? And then all the congregation goes, mm-hmm. And I was sitting there going, mm-mm. I remember looking at my friend saying, hey, who's David and Goliath? He said, dude, David was like a shepherd boy and Goliath was like a giant. And I was like, what? That's in the Bible? He's like, yeah, there's a, there's a giant. It's huge. I was like, what happened? He said, oh, the boy killed the giant. I was like, dude, what do you use? He's a rock. I was like, you're lying to me. You're lying to me. That ain't in the Bible. That's where I was at. I knew nothing about the Bible. So I decided to read the Bible for eight hours a day for two years. That was the commitment I made to God. I would study it for eight hours a day for two years, and that's exactly what I did. And on my journey of studying the Bible and learning the scriptures for myself, uh, I began to really appreciate knowledge. Who here appreciates knowledge? Any knowledge appreciators out there? You like just learning? Amen. So I, I, I developed this great appreciation for knowledge, and then, you know, eventually when you become good at something or grow in something, Satan loves to kind of give you a little bit of pride, doesn't he? Doesn't he love to slip a little pride into your heart when you're not looking? Well, I got this great idea with one of my buddies of mine. I said, hey, I said, I think we know our Bibles really well. I think we should test our skills. He said, test our skills? I said, yeah, I think we should go to other churches and debate people at their churches. We should test our skills with how well we really know the Bible. So I, I said, let's go. Let's start with the church when I was a little kid my parents took me to. And they said, are you serious? I said, yeah, let's do it. So I went there and uh, started debating um, 
other pastors of other churches on the Bible just because I wanted to test knowledge with another scholar. You know, I wanted another scholar in my life to test knowledge with. And all of a sudden, I began to come to this conclusion that by God's grace, after a couple years of really making the Bible a priority, I actually knew a lot of information about the Bible. And then, something happened after two years. I became a little bit settled in my ways. I remember I'd wake up in the morning and think, well, I don't really need to read the Bible as much as I used to because I know it so well. Or, you know, maybe... I mean, I know I used to memorize Scripture, but why do I need to keep memorizing Scripture if I have enough memorized? And I remember I could wake up in my sleeping bag and, you know, not even open the Bible and just think about Bible stories. I was like, why can't I just do that instead of reading my Bible? And one thing led to another, and I remember one day I woke up and I realized for a significant amount of time, I had not read my Bible. And for a significant amount of time, I had not prayed. And I thought to myself, but what happened? How is it that, and I noticed, old habits that had once died were starting to come back again. Things that I had overcome coming out of atheism and the Christianity that I thought would never come back in my life again started to poke their heads in my life again. And I thought, how is this happening? How could I start slipping on my Christian journey if I know so much about the Bible? And that leads us to the presentation today, The Power of the Mind as a Man Thinks. I want to share with you my favorite verse to, to introduce the subject. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. This, most of the uh, text will be on the screen. I do encourage you to at least jot them down if you're not uh, going to follow along in your own Bibles, because the last person you should ever trust is a preacher. Amen? 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 Amen. Last, look, when you're dealing with eternal salvation, okay, if you're dealing with like a boba shop or a, a favorite restaurant, eh, it's okay. You can just trust someone and go give it a try. When it's your salvation, you can't just trust people. Amen? You need to look it up for yourself. So, I encourage you, write down the text. I'm nothing. I am simply a donkey that God will speak through because He's done it once before. He'll do it again. You are to open up your own Bibles and study it for yourself so you can know what the Word of the Lord teaches. So, it will be on the screen for uh, ease, um, but I do encourage you at least write down the references or if you're not able to follow along to make sure that what is spoken is accurate. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, I believe we're all there. One of my favorite texts in Scripture, it says here, Paul says, And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, I want you to catch that. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know it. Is that a good text of scripture or what? I remember when I read that one day, I said, Lord, way to give me a humble pill right there. It's like, how many of you think you know something about anything? We would all raise our hands, right? You know something about something. God says, that is an indication that you know nothing. As well as you should know it. So, how many of you have heard a sermon on the second coming numerous times? Numerous times you've heard a message on the second coming of Jesus. Amen? I'm sure you've heard it numerous times. That's okay. You do not know that subject as you ought to know it. See, when I read this text, I realized I can never come to a point when I say, I know that as I ought to know it. The Bible says, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to. Because we have such a finite mind trying to grasp infinite concepts. So I want to talk about three points on the power of the mind and remembering. Number one, we're going to talk about the principle of remembering in Scripture. The principle of remembering in Scripture. Number two, we're going to talk about the power of the thoughts and what happens because of our thoughts. And number three, we're going to make it practical and look at some daily applications. So I hope you're excited uh, for what we're going to cover today. So let's go with the principle. The principle of remembering. Have you ever found the Bible to be repetitious? You know, when I read the Bible straight through cover to cover, I realized the Bible is actually repetitious. Uh, it may use different stories, but it's really teaching the same, same thing over and over and over. And once you get to the New Testament, it's bluntly repetitious. Like, it doesn't just teach the same thing with different stories. It literally says the same things over and over and over again. Mostly because the New Testament is written by a few authors. Why does the Bible keep reminding us of what we already know? 
Let's talk about this. Jude uh, 1 verse 5. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. So Jude chapter 1 verse 5. Notice here what the Bible says. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this. Now pause right there. If you once knew this, that means presently you have forgotten. That's right. So I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The whole epistle of Jude here given was given for one purpose, and it was to remind people. So should the book of Jude be anything new to these people? No, it really shouldn't be anything new, because he's saying, I'm writing so that I want to remind you, though you once knew this. How many of you have had the experience when you've been to church on Sabbath, or for me, uh, like a youth conference, uh, like a GYC, or a Southwest, or a, you know, a Faith, Hope, Love, or any of those, like you've been to like a, an event, ca- uh, campery, whatever, and you had a powerful experience, you had a powerful sermon, you had tears in your eyes, when the speaker made the appeal, you got up and you walked forward, and you said, Lord, I want to make that decision. This happened to me once in uh, 2008, Southwest Youth Conference in California. I went, made a, po- it was a powerful sermon. I was like, tears in my eyes. I made this decision. I was a brand new Christian. I was like, let's do this. And I remember like four months later, my, one of my friends was talking with me. He said, hey, how was that event you went to? I'm thinking about going next year. I said, it was powerful. He said, oh, what was the message about? <laughs> Bro, it was powerful. Okay, did you, did you go for, up for the appeal? I did, man. I had tears and I was moved and I just wanted to change my life. What was it about? But it was powerful. You just had to have been there. Like, you know, you know can, can you relate with me? Okay. Humans forget. Humans forget. I was a teacher at a Bible college for about nine years. Humans forget. I learned this. They will forget 95%. You will probably forget 90 to 95% of everything I'm saying today. So you have to be very selective what you seek to remember from this presentation. Humans forget, and therefore we need to be reminded. So here it makes sense in the Bible. Why is the Bible so repetitious? Well, because as humans, we easily forget. So God is constantly reminding us of what we already know, and there's a reason we're going to get to that. Let's go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Continuing with our first point, we're looking at three points today. Our first point, the principle of remembering. The principle of remembering. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Now, question, in this verse, have the people forgotten what they know? They have not forgotten. It says, though you know and are, what's that key word? It's the E, established in the present truth. In other words, you know it and you are applying it to your life today. But he says that he still has to remind them. Now, we understand if you forget, you need to be reminded because you forgot, right? But why would you remind someone of something they already, of all, they already know? And notice what Peter says here. He says, for this reason, I will not be negligent. In other words, if he doesn't tell them what they already know and are already doing, he would actually be a negligent minister. Isn't that interesting? Now, don't raise your hands. Rhetorical question, just to chew on. How many of us come to church every Sabbath hoping to hear something new? Hoping to hear a new thing, a new truth, a new perspective, right? Right? I know for me, as a, as a young Christian, I would always go to church, and if it was something I already knew, two minutes into the sermon, I'm like, I know where he's going with this. I pull out my own book and start reading my own book, but in the back pew, you know, I start reading my book. Great controversy or something. Now I'm just going to read something else then. I already know this. As humans, we're always looking for something new, something different, something interesting. Peter here says that's not the purpose of ministers. A, a true minister will always remind you of what you already know. Isn't that interesting? So when your preachers come here and they preach on something you already know, praise God, they're doing their job. Amen? They are doing their jobs. But why? Why is it that we need to be reminded so often of what we already know? 
The answer is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. We're going to skip a few verses and get to this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. The answer is right here. Paul makes it plain. And it is such an interesting concept that when I learned this years ago from a mentor of mine, when I learned this concept, it radically changed my life. It radically changed my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you've received, and wherein you stand. Now there's three parts here in, in the verse I want you to catch. Number one, what is, or four parts, what is Paul about to preach to them? What's the subject matter? What's the content? The gospel. The gospel that's right. He's about to preach the gospel. Now have they heard it before? Have they accepted it before? And are they being faithful in it? So that is like me preaching this sermon and next Sabbath coming back and preaching the same sermon again. Now you might think that's strange, wouldn't you? Imagine if a preacher came three weeks in a row and all three weeks he preached the, preached the exact same sermon with the exact same verses and the exact same illustrations with the exact same appeal. Wouldn't you think something's off? You might think something's off, right? You might think maybe this guy's forgetting where he's at or something. I don't know. Paul here is telling them, and he's telling them, I'm gonna t he's telling them what he's going to tell them. He's saying, I'm going to tell you the gospel. I know you've heard it. I know you've accepted it. I know you're even being faithful. Me preaching it is no indication of your lack of faithfulness. But I'm going to tell you again. Why, Paul? Notice verse 2 and don't miss it. By which you are saved. How many of you are glad the gospel can save you? Amen? Amen? When I think back on the life that I lived before and the lifestyle I lived before as an atheist, I am thankful that the gospel was power enough to save me. Amen. But what's that next scary word uh, on the screen? By which also you are saved? If. if. Let me illustrate this word from my junior high years. When I was in junior high, my dad made a deal with me. How many of you guys like when your parents make deals with you, right? I love it. And my dad made a deal with me. He says, I will give you $100. Now, I don't sound like a lot of money, but when you're in junior high, I mean, you feel like you're, you know, you're a you know, Fortune 500 business owner when you have $100 in your pocket. So my dad says, look, I will give you $100. I said, yes. And then he said, if. And I learned that I did not like this word at a young age. He said, if. You get straight A's. No A minuses. Straight A's. What did the if do to the promise? The promise was $100. What did the if do to the promise? It made it conditioned, right? In other words, what if I came with straight B's? Can I expect the promise? No. What if I get all A's and one A minus? Could I expect the promise? No. The if gave the condition on which the promise would be experienced. Needless to say, I never got the hundred dollars. <laughs> but praise God, I had a job. <laughs> the Bible just told us that the gospel can save you if. That should perk our ears up. That should really cause us to pay attention. It should make us have a level of concern, actually. Because it teaches us that the gospel's ability to save you is conditional. If, notice what it says, you keep in what? Memory. What I preach unto you. Notice this. Unless you believed in, in vain. Vain means pointless. Is it enough to believe the truth? Hmm. Is it enough to just know what is true? That kind of hits hard, doesn't it? How often do we pride ourselves that we know truth? Oh, I, I know the second coming. I know the manner of the coming. I won't be deceived. Praise the Lord. Right? Oh, I know the truth about you know, different subjects in Scripture that other people don't know about. I, I know these things. I, Daniel Revelation, like the back of my hand. Praise the Lord. I can quote that 2300 day prophecy. I'm in the 1% of Christianity. Right? We feel this way with our knowledge of the Bible. But is it enough to know what is true? No. Does knowing right and wrong save a man? No. Notice this. The gospel can only save you if you keep it in... If I can use a modern vernacular, 
it only saves you if you think about it. That's kind of a weird thought, isn't that? The gospel can only save you if it gets your attention and you actually choose to think about it. Not just knowing it's true, but contemplating the truth of it. Let's continue. Number two, the power of the thoughts. Point two, power of the thoughts. How is that true? How can that be a reality? We're going to talk about this. The most powerful ten words in Scripture, in my opinion, in all aspects of life, is right here in Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, what's those next three words? So is he. Have you ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? You are, you ever heard that, right? Yeah, yeah. You eat junk food, right? Got a junky, you get junk, you get junky health, right? Literally, when you eat food, it gets broken down and it becomes a part of who you are as a person, right? Did you know the same thing happens with what you think about? It's not just what you physically eat that becomes a part of you. What you think about actually becomes a part of you. It says here, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, why are you you today? Whatever that you are today as a person, why are you you? You are you because you are simply the sum total of all your previous thoughts. Isn't that an interesting concept? You are you today. I am me today because of the sum total of the things I have chosen in life to, to think about. I'll give you an example. Back when I was a cage fighter, back in my young years, and uh, I wanted to get amped up for um, the competition, I used to listen to music that made me... Do you think I listened to music that made me feel happy and lighthearted? Do you think I listened to music like, you know, Over the Rainbow and stuff like that? No, I didn't listen to that, right? I listened to music that made me angry, right? Because it was trying to get myself psyched up for the competition. And I realized after years of listening to this type of music for competitive purposes to get all amped up, guess what kind of a person I became? An angry person. I remember even outside of the competition, I started getting in fights with people. And I realized, wow, by, by thinking this way all the time, it actually made me into a very angry person and I learned at a young age that you will become what you what you think this is why the Bible says in Luke 6 45 that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good doesn't that make sense if you have a good brain a good mind that thinks on good things then what kind of things we talk about good things and it says and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil you think about evil things, eventually you're going to talk about evil things. It's because what you think about. You will become what you think. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everything that you do in life first must come from right here. You have to think it before you do it, right? Consciously or unconsciously, you have to think it before you do it. This is why the entire great controversy is a battle over a very small battleground. The battleground of the entire great controversy is right here. It's for your mind. It's for your thoughts. Because if you just choose to think different, you would become a different person. Because as a man thinks, so is he. That's right. Therefore, the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23... Keep your heart with all diligence. Uh, 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 Young's literal translation says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your mind with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. You know, I heard a wealthy businessman once say that once you understand that what you think will eventually be made manifest in your life, you become really careful what you allow in your mind. I'll say that again. This wealthy businessman said, once he realized that what you think about will eventually become manifested in your life. You become very careful what you allow into your mind. Whether it's movies or music or people, thoughts and ideas, whatever comes in over time will eventually come out in the life. 
Let me give you a biblical story where this actually happened. It's our scripture reading, Numbers 13, 31 to 33. I'm, uh, you, I'm not sure if you caught it, but let's look at the story again. And the emphasis is on the last verse, but the buildup will help us to see. We know in this story the spy, the 12 spies were sent into the land in Canaan, correct? To spy out the land. And does any remember how many came back with a bad report? Yeah. Yeah. 10 came back with a bad report. How many came back with a good report? Two, right? Okay. So here's the story. They come back and here's what happens. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Here's the bad report, right? And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. Talk about exaggeration, right? It's a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of what kind of stature? Great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. Now don't miss it. This is the main part. And we were like grasshoppers where? In our own sight. Notice this. And so, or in other words, because of this, and so we were in... As a man thinks, so is he. I love this story. Did they have to be grasshoppers in the sight? No. What did Joshua and Caleb say? No. They are bread for us. What do you do to bread? You eat bread, right? He said, "These are he said, no, no, those giants, they're like a sandwich waiting for us to eat the sandwich. Are you scared of your sandwich? No. Then why are you scared of them? But because in their minds... They saw themselves in the mirror and said, You're just a grasshopper. You can't do it. That became their reality. A wise saying once, go, once said goes this way, Those who say they can and those who say they cannot are often both usually right. I'll say it again, that those who say they can and those who say they cannot are often both usually right. Because as a man thinks... So he will be. If you, believe, if you believe you are a grasshopper, then what shall you be? You shall be a grasshopper. But if you believe that you are a giant, what shall you be? You will be a giant. How many of you want to be successful in your career one day? Whatever career you do, you just want to be successful in your career. Successful nurse, successful mechanic, right? Successful plumber. No, a plumber in California is a multimillionaire as a plumber. You can be successful in anything you want in life, right? If you enjoy it and you're good at it. Do you believe it? Do you believe that you can accomplish great things? Do you believe you can be good at your trade? Do you believe you can aspire to do great things? You have to believe it for yourself. You have to think it in order for it to become a living reality. Let's talk about the Bible. How many of you want to be a better Christian? How many of you have a deeper walk with God? Do you believe you can? Amen, through Christ. That's right. But sadly, I meet so many young people, with young people that say, Anthony, I, look, I want to be a better Christian, but I just don't come from the right family. Anthony, I want to be a better Christian, but I just hate reading. I can never love reading. Look, I came from a very poor background in the ghetto in California. My, my, my speech was very limited. It was very poor. And when I read the Great Controversy, 50% of the words I did not even understand. I used a dictionary. It would take me hours to finish one chapter because it took me so long to work through it. I remember after 15 to 20 minutes of reading, I would get these migraines because I was not a reader. I did not read books. I, I got kicked out of high school at a young age. I did not read. I did not enjoy reading. And I used to have to take like Tylenol and Advil just to read the Bible because my head hurt so bad. It was like a muscle that had never been used in certain areas. And now I love reading. Before I had like no comprehension. Now God has given me a great comprehension. Because there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Our, uh, our uh, medical students that are going to medical school. There is nothing more calculated to make your brain stand above the crowd than to study the scriptures. Amen. As you think, so you will be. What do you think of yourself? What do you tell yourself? What do you believe about yourself? It will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and that is what you will become. So if you want to be like Jesus, instead of telling yourself, you can't be like Jesus, you have this background, you've done these things, you don't even like these songs, you don't even like this stuff, 
You can't do it? Instead of telling yourself that, tell yourself, I know you're not doing it today the way you want to do it, but by God's grace, you can grow to be the Christian you want to be. Amen? Amen. You got to talk to yourself differently. You got to speak words of faith. And it's not just in your spiritual life. If you understand this thought, you could apply it to any area of your life. I have. To my finances, to my side work, to my, scholast- uh, my academia. I have applied this principle to everything and have accomplished things that I did not think 10 years ago I could ever have accomplished. It's what you think you will be. The Bible teaches this principle in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with veiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. What you behold, or what you think about, you will be transformed into it. Now this word transformed, the Greek word is where we get our word metamorphosis. Now if you're familiar with the word metamorphosis, it is describing a complete change that occurs, whether it's a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, or in the dictionary, it described a spiritual experience, actually. I was kind of shocked to see that in the dictionary. Um, a spiritual experience of becoming from one type of person to a completely new type of person. See, the Bible is saying that God has the ability to completely change you to a new creature. Who you are two years from now could be a night and day difference from who you are today. Amen? Amen. Just because you are a certain way now it does not mean you have to stay that way. If that were true, there would have been no hope for me. There would have been no hope. If you knew the baggage I had to carry, if you knew the burdens that I bore, if you knew these sins I've committed, if you knew the addictions that I've had, if you knew the struggles that I faced at a young age because of where I grew up, people, my friends, when I told them I'm become a Christian, they laughed at me. You're going to be a Christian? Do you even think that's possible? They're going to kick you out. They're going to ban you from all the churches. That's what I used to be told. Stuff like that. And yet here I am today. Why? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I'm going to skip some of these things for the sake of time. Let's get to the daily application. I don't like my uh, presentations to be very long. Daily application, or point, a third point. Third point. What can we do on a day-to-day basis to help us to change our thinking? Because at the end of the day, Satan is battling for your mind. If he can get you distracted thinking on worldly things, Uh, thinking negative about yourself, pulling yourself down, not believing in yourself. If He can get you to think this way, then that will become your life. And God is also fighting for your brain too. He's trying to get you to think opposite. trying to get you to think of heavenly things, amen? Amen. Trying to get you to think about Jesus. Trying to get you to think about positive. Trying to get you to look in the mirror and to believe in the capabilities that God has implanted within you, amen? amen? Matthew 25, the story of the talents. Every man was given talents for the Lord. Talents in life. Every one of you are a beyond talented person right now. And the question is, do you believe it? Do you see it with the eye of faith? You may not see it today in how you're living, but do you see it with the eye of faith? So how can we help ourselves to retrain the mind? Because it doesn't happen overnight, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law, in reference to uh, the writings of Moses, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it how often? Day and night. Again, God is dealing with the mind. Often we hear the word meditate and we think of like uh, um, Eastern religion stuff. Um, Meditation is very biblical. It's very biblical. But meditation is not emptying yourself. It's filling yourself. There is a difference. Eastern meditation says empty yourself. Biblical meditation says fill yourself with the knowledge of God. Meditate on the things of God. So it says here, uh, you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all... That is written in it. Now notice this. The meditation comes before the doing, doesn't it? Often, as Christians, we get discouraged. Because we read something in the Bible, and then we think because we read it, that's how we should be automatically. But doesn't it really happen that quickly sometimes? Sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes it may. But most of the time, for me at least, it it didn't, you know? When I was first convicted that Christians shouldn't drink alcoholic beverages... And I used to drink 30 beverages a night. Um, It didn't change overnight. It it really didn't. When I first learned that, I thought, whoa, that is a new revolution to my mind. And God had to work with me and give me the victory. Amen. Amen. So the doing doesn't happen automatic. But what helps the doing become possible? The meditation. It's what you think about you will eventually become. So I used to tell myself, like, 
by God's grace, you, you can gain the victory or in, over these sins in your life. But you have to fill yourself. That's the key. You have to meditate in order to change. Matthew 12 warns us about emptying ourselves. It says here, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Here we have an interesting story Jesus was teaching, a parable. And it's describing an unclean spirit that was cast out of a house. Well, the house would represent a person, right? Cast out of the person. And this unclean spirit was cast out of the person and kind of wandered around, said, man, there ain't nothing to do. Let me go back and check out my old house. Came back to the house and how did he find it? What's the key word there? Empty. Empty. Was there anything in there? No. Did anyone else move in? No. And so he said, oh, really? No one lives here? Sweet. So then it says, he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. That's a very scary story. Is it enough to remove bad things out of our lives? No. We need to replace it with something good. You see, when that demon came and knocking, instead of finding an empty house, someone should have answered the door with nail-pierced hands. He should have said, actually, hi, I live here now. This is my home. Because he has filled his mind with me. Often in life we want to be different, and so we try to be different by just eliminating the bad. But it doesn't work that way. Daily you have to choose to read the Bible and to meditate on that which is good in order to be different, in order to be transformed, in order to be changed. This is why First Peter says that we are born again, not of incorruptible seed, but through the Word of God. That's how you're born again. That's how you become a new creature. You cannot be a new creature if you do not spend time in the Word of God. It breaks my heart when I meet people on the Christian journey who have been struggling for years, trying to overcome and trying to be a new creature in Christ. And I ask them, how is your devotion life? How is your time with God in the morning? And it's non-existent. It breaks my heart because they're fighting a fight they can never win on their own. You cannot win that fight without the Bible, without the Word of God. Amen. It will change you. It will be the stability of your times. It will be the source of your victory. We need to hide the Word of God in our minds. When, when, when these demons come back to us, they should find our house so full with God that there's no room for them to enter in again. Amen. I'm literally begging you, spend time in your Bibles. Yes, you may know a lot. Yes, you may have been in the Christian game for decades now. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Learn from my story. It's not what you know that matters. It's what you think about. What do you think about on a daily basis? What is filling your mind? What is filling your heart? This is what will change you. This is what will transform you. To close and to review with review. What do we talk about today? Number one. That the Bible authors have a burden to remind us of what we already know. That's what they do. Most of the Bible is written to just simply remind you of what you already know. Why? Because it's only when truth has your attention, when you're thinking about it, when you're actually meditating on it on a daily basis, that it has power to change you. It, yeah, you may know and believe Jesus is coming soon, but if you don't think about the fact that He's coming soon on a, on a daily basis, that truth does, not, does nothing for your life. It doesn't change your life at all. It's just something that you know. In the same way you know 2 plus 2 is 4, it's information you know, but if not thought about daily, makes no impact. Yes, it's true the gospel can save you, that Christ died for your sins, but if we don't give that attention every day to choose to think about the fact that the gospel is real and that Christ died in me and let that create a love within me, the information does us no good. What do you think about? What has your attention? What has your affections? And then our last point. We should daily spend time um, not just studying the Bible, but meditating on it. Choosing to fill our minds practically every day with good things. That's the daily process. That's the daily practical step there. What's the takeaway? If you remember just one thing, spend time in the Word of God every day. Amen. Not to just read it, but to spend time thinking about it. When you read the Bible and learn something, stop. Stop. Pause. Close your eyes so you can focus. And choose to just meditate upon that thought until that thought becomes your own thought. Until that thought becomes a way that you live. 
when I read about the leper and how God was willing to cleanse a leper, I stopped and closed my eyes as a young, young Christian. And I said, God, if you're willing to touch that leper, you're willing to touch my filthy heart. And I thought about that for like an hour. It was just such an amazing thought that God would be so loving that He would condescend from the heavens to deal with a person like me. See, it's thinking about that that warms the heart, lifts the spirit. Knowing that didn't do that, it's thinking about it. It changes the life. What will have your attention? The three angels have begun to sound their distinct messages. The Bible teaches that Christ is coming soon. Revelation points us to a people that have the Father's name in their forehead, the very character of Jesus. They have had a heart transformation. This mind is in them that was also in Christ Jesus, according to Philippians 2 verse 5. They have had a complete and radical transformation, but it didn't happen overnight. It was a journey of a thousand miles that began with one footstep, and that was opening the Bible to spend time with Jesus. And of these people it will be said, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. How many of you want to be part of that people under the three angels' message? Amen? Amen. Christ is coming soon. He will break through the clouds with all of its glory. The question is not if He will come, and the question even isn't when He will come. The question is, have you begun your journey of a million miles with that step? The daily step of opening the Word of God, spending time with Him, and meditating upon Him, that when He comes, you can look and say, this is my God, I have waited for Him. I recognize Him and He knows me and He will save me. Father in Heaven, we thank You for the chance to study Your Word this morning. I pray earnestly that somehow You will reach our minds. It's so easy in this world with school, work, television, movies, video games, social media. It is so easy for our minds to be engrossed as the great controversy says Um, that Satan seeks to engross our minds, not even to make us evil, but even just distracted, and thinking on anything but you, so that we will never become like you. Help us, Lord, in a world that is so busy, to every day pause, and to spend that time, not just doing a checklist, not just reading another book amongst the many things that we have to read or do, but help us to come apart, and to spend time, and commune with heaven. And to think about these things. To meditate on your love, your mercy, your goodness. To meditate on the stories in the Bible that we wouldn't just know what is true, but that we would love what is true. That we wouldn't just believe what is true, but that we would experience what is true. Forgive us for not allowing you to take our whole hearts and only to take the intellectual side. But help us to give you the throne of our hearts full priority and to choose to commune and to think on you daily that we may become like you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.